Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. church. Guys, I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, today, uh, we're, we're not actually going to spend a whole lot of time in Psalm 119. I, I just thought it'd be a good idea to have that kind of read over us. Um, uh, Shamas kicked off a brand new series last week um, called Core Practices. Um, and this is actually a series that in some form or fashion we do every single year. Last year it was called Fully Devoted. Um, we looked at the same general topics, but we looked at them in the context of Acts chapter 2 from which they come. And, and we explored how they, they, they grow and, and how they are invested in new believers throughout the journey of the early church in the book of Acts. And, and the reason that we do this series every single year, the reason we've made that commitment that we will revisit these topics every single year is, is be, because we believe they form a foundation for who we're called to be as the gathered church. So I want to make sure you're aware of them. We talk about them from time to time. The Lord's Supper, that's what Shamas talked about last week. We often call it communion. Biblical teaching, that's what we're going to talk about today. Developing healthy relationships. Our discipleship pastor, Aaron Buchanan, is going to talk about that next week. And then we're going to talk about presenting tithes and offerings, earnest prayer. These are things that we talk about on a very regular basis, but these are things that we do on a very regular basis. In fact, every single time we gather, we devote our time to making sure that these five things are accomplished. So, so we do them very regularly, we talk about them very regularly, we explore them very regularly. And you may be asking yourself, with all of that repetition, couldn't this get rather repetitive? And that would be a very astute observation. Yes, it will get repetitive, but that's very much on purpose. There's a reason that we're calling this series Core Practices, because that's what these things are. I know it's, you know what the word practice means, but let's look at the definition for a moment. Practice is a repeated exercise in or a performance of an activity or skill so as to acquire and maintain proficiency in it. That can sound a bit complicated. Let's make it easier. Here, here's what we mean when we say practice. Repetition combined with intentionality leads to growth. We believe this to be true. We believe that repetition combined with intentionality leads to God's church growing, both corporately but more importantly as individuals. And this is what we want, what, what we want when it comes to these commitments. We want them to be core practices or exercises that we are consistently allowing to shape us when we gather. So not only are we committed to studying them in depth each year, but we are committed to live in these five practices every single time we meet together, to participate in them. Every time we gather, these things are practiced in some form or fashion. And, and here's the beauty about these practices. They, they are not stifled by repetition. In fact, they, they only get stronger the more we repeat them because there is so much depth to each of them. There is so much that we can explore. We could repeat this series for decades and still there would be more to learn and more to experience in each of these regards. And, and so let's dive into what we're talking about today. As I said, today we're talking about biblical 
teaching. Um, but really it should look something like this, biblical preaching slash teaching. Those words often get used interchangeably, which is totally okay, but there is a slight difference between them. Preaching uh, is the proclamation of God's word. Preaching typically presents itself in a, di- in a monologue fashion, okay? That's what happens when somebody comes up here. We are speaking to you. You are the listeners. This is a one-way conversation. At least it's supposed to be a one-way conversation. Like amen, stuff like that, totally fine. Don't talk to me while I'm doing this. That's, it's, it's uncomfortable and weird for everybody. So, uh, but, but that's what preaching is. Preaching is standing before a body of people, before a crowd of people, and proclaiming God's truth. And then there's teaching. And we see Christ do this often. And we're actually told in Scripture when Christ is teaching, he actually sits amongst those he's teaching. His early followers, Sermon on the Mount, perfect example of this. Christ sat amongst them, and he began to teach them about his kingdom. A teaching is more of a dialogue. It's more relational. It's more of a conversation. But, but the key when it comes to teaching is it's not just illuminating truth. It's investing that truth. It's making sure that not only do you understand this truth, but, but you understand how to apply this truth, how to put this truth into action. And so because Christ was devoted to both of these things, because the early church was devoted to both of those things, we want to be devoted to both of these things. And so every single time you gather with us, somebody is going to preach from this stage. We're going to preach out of God's word, and we're going to do our best to illuminate as much of that truth as possible. But we also have countless opportunities for, for you to be taught by God's word, whether that's an elective class, a, a special study like, like the Revelation one we have going on right now, or, or whether that's one of our campus groups or a home group. Those are all key opportunities to sit under the teaching of God's word. And, and so we're very, very much committed to both of these, and here is why that is so important. Here's where Psalm 119 ties in. Verse 105 says this, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Why this is important is that if we believe there is something we are moving toward, something we have been called to, something that we were individually created to become, then we must embrace that God's word, the scriptures, is the illumination necessary to make that journey and follow that path. Now, Psalm 119 is is a super interesting psalm. It's a ridiculously long psalm. In in fact, it is twice as long as the next longest psalm. It it is incredibly long. King David wrote it, and he actually wrote it in 22 unique parts. They're all very, very similar, but but, but there's evidence that, that it's divided into 22 chunks. What's interesting is that there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And so, Later manuscripts began began, uh, being labeled by each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It seems as though David was writing a portion of this psalm to correspond to each letter. (coughs) Excuse me. Why he did that, we're not 100% sure. Some scholars have thrown out the possibility that perhaps David wrote this as a meditation for himself, and he categorized it this way so that he could meditate on it in chunks. For example, maybe one night he sits down and he decides, you know what, I'm going to meditate on God's word. I'm going to think about Aleph, which is the first letter in the Hebrew Bible, or in the Hebrew alphabet, excuse me. And so he starts meditating on that portion of the psalm. And then the next night he moves on to the next letter, and then the next day he moves on to the next letter, and then the next and the next and the next. Absolutely a possibility of how David utilized this song. But here is the bigger observation when it comes to this psalm. Here's why I think it is so special. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. 176 verses that are all focused on the exact same thing. Every single verse is focused on the exact same thing. The worth, the value, and the power of God's word. It is David reiterating for 106 verses that he is completely consumed by God's word. Now, here is why that's mind-blowing to me. Because at this point in history, David likely only has access to the first five books of the Bible. 
That's it. That, that's all he has access to. He, he has the first five books of the Bible, which are known as the books of law. They were recorded by Moses. They're Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Some of you are doing read through the Bible in a year plan. I've talked to many of you about that. Some of you are just doing a general read through the year plan. Some of you are on the chronological reading plan. That's awesome. Either way, at this point in the year, if you're on track, you're probably through these first five books. And if you've read these first five books, you've encountered a lot of really neat stuff, a lot of familiar stories, a lot of cool moments. You've also encountered a lot of long lists and weird names and odd situations and confusing stuff. If we're being really, really honest about the first five books of the Bible, there's some really great stuff in there. There's also, admittedly, some boring stuff in there, like some hard to understand stuff, some, some long and monotonous stuff. This is the scripture that David had access to. This is the scripture that he goes on for 176 verses to say, I'm completely consumed by this. It is so good for my soul. And the fact that David was so consumed by just the five first, first five books of the Bible, it should be somewhat convicting to us in light of the fact that we have so much more. Especially when, when you think in the context of this statement from Christ himself. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. This is in that Sermon on the Mount that I mentioned before. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, first five books of the Bible, or the prophets, the rest of the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It makes me wonder and imagine the psalm that David would write on this side of the Messiah. The fulfillment of everything that God had begun to do in those first five books. God's perfect love with skin on. Finally standing up to sin in a way that no one else could. No king, no prophet, no one. But Christ did. And now we have the full expression of that truth at our fingertips. We, we, we should be considerably more obsessed with God's word than King David was. This is why preaching and teaching is one of our core practices. This is why we are fully committed that every single time we gather, we will dive in to God's word because this is the lamp to our feet. This is what illuminates the path to life, the life that Christ came to deliver, the life that he gave his life to make possible the life that you and I have been invited to, it is found on the pages of Scripture. This is where we meet Jesus Christ. And this is why we are committed to studying it on a regular basis. But here's the question I, I really want us to tackle today. This is what I want us to think about. <clears throat> what does God's Word want to accomplish when we hear it preached and taught. So, so when we share God's word from this stage in the many different forms that we have already this morning, we've read scripture multiple times. When we share God's word, when you dive into God's word with a group of people in a smaller teaching format, when you dive into God's word as an individual, when you read it by yourself, what is God's word attempting to do in our hearts and minds? And it brings to mind the, the, the song we sang this morning about the good soil that ties to the parable of the soil, one of Christ's most famous parables. And, and the sower goes out, right, and he scatters this seed, and, and Christ wants to illuminate the fact that, that that seed falls on many different forms of soil. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on each of the soils, but ultimately the, the point of the parable is that God's desire is that our hearts would be made up of good soil, soil that is receptive to God's word. And when our hearts are that, the crop that it yields is absolutely mind-blowing. Christ conveys this in the parable. The, the, the yielding that he describes, it's extravagant. It's extreme. And what it reminds us of is that God's word is capable of incredible growth in us. It is capable of incredible breakthroughs. It is, in, it is capable of incredible life change when our hearts and our minds are receptive. But here's the thing about God's word. Is it is capable of doing both the preparing of the soil and the investment and growth of the seed. And so in a sense, God's word desires to do both, but, but it desires to prepare our hearts 
first because we have to be that good soil. If God's word is going to do anything in our hearts, our hearts have to be good soil. And God's word is, is ready and prepared and capable of helping prepare our hearts for that investment. <clears throat> and so ultimately what I want to get at this morning is two verses in 2 Timothy. Okay, that's, that's what we're going to work towards. But, but we're going to take kind of a long meandering journey to get there because I think context is important. So we're going to work our way to 2 Timothy, but we're going to actually start in Acts chapter 20. And here's why we're starting in Acts chapter 20. In the 20th chapter of Acts, Paul, the, the apostle who, who would eventually write the letter of 2 Timothy, who eventually wrote most of the letters in the New Testament, he's on a journey. Okay, it's a long journey. It's a very, very important journey. And ultimately, this journey is going to lead to Jerusalem. But Paul's got this very ominous feeling about this journey. You see, persecution is on the rise for, for believers, especially for Paul. He's, he's ruffling a lot of feathers with, with the things that he's saying, with the things that he's doing. And so there's a lot of resistance coming against Paul. And Paul knows that this resistance is going to come to a crescendo. In fact, the Holy Spirit has essentially given Paul insight that this resistance, this persecution is ultimately going to lead to his death. And he thinks that's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. And so he's working his way towards Jerusalem. He believes that in Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to ultimately be sentenced to death and I'm going to be killed. And so he spends a lot of this journey to Jerusalem saying goodbye to people. Now, this, this is not ultimately what happens in, in Paul's journey to Jerusalem. Paul does, in fact, get arrested in Jerusalem. <coughs> he gets sent to Rome. He's held in prison for a little while, but he actually gets out. He gets out. He goes, does a few more things. He eventually goes back to prison in Rome, and that's when he dies, the second imprisonment in Rome. But none of that has happened yet in Acts 20, and Paul has no idea any of that is going to happen. Fun fact, after this series, we're actually going to start a series on Paul, and then we're going to go into a very long study on Romans. Why are we doing that? Because I'm a glutton for punishment. Revelation, Romans, same year. Our Christmas series is going to be 20 weeks in Leviticus, so get ready. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. And I, I need a nap. Uh, <clears throat> but that's, that's kind of what's going on the, the, when, when we get to Acts chapter 20. Paul's on this journey. We kind of know where this journey is going to go. Paul is not aware yet, but he knows it's going to be real, real bad. So he's saying goodbye to a lot of people. And then, then check this out. Acts chapter 20, starting verse 17. I'm going to read a whole lot just so you have the context, but, 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 but I'll, I'll make the point when we get through it. Verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus. For the elders of the church. This is key. He's sending to Ephesus for the elders of the church. This is a church that Paul planted. When they arrived, so these elders, they come to him, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. That's all the persecution I was talking about. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's proclaiming Jesus Christ both in the form of preaching and in the form of teaching. He's investing this gospel truth in the community of Ephesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. This is Paul's Psalm 119 moment. This is how much he believes in the truth of Scripture. He's willing to give his life for it. Verse 25. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Remember, he's talking to the elders, the leaders of the local church. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought, bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. 
Wolves are coming. That's the heart of Paul's message. They're going to come from the inside and the outside. We're not talking about literal wolves. We're talking about people who will use a platform to lead people astray. We're we're talking about the rising presence of evil and false teaching. (coughs) And what tools does the enemy use? He uses distraction. He uses deception. And what are they aimed at? The destruction of soil. And so Paul says, be on your guard. And that leads us to the purpose of the letters to Timothy. As I said, Paul was released from his first imprisonment in Rome. And when he was released from Rome, he starts checking in with all the churches. He starts sending to find out what's going on. And he gets a letter informing him of what's going on in Ephesus. And what happened in Ephesus? The wolves came. And the elders bent. And they began to compromise. And the church in Ephesus was a complete disaster. And so what Paul decides to do, because he has a lot of work to do, is a lot of churches to visit, is he grabs his apprentice, Timothy, and he sends him to Ephesus to essentially be their pastor. Go and preach the word to them. And so he writes this letter, which we know as 1 Timothy, to Timothy, but he gives it to Timothy. He says, carry this with you. This is for you, to prepare you, but it's also to give you credibility with the elders in Ephesus. Go and preach the word. And and 1 Timothy is an absolutely incredible book. And so Timothy goes, things do not go well. And so Paul himself eventually goes to Ephesus to try to straighten things out. Specifically, he's going to go and deal with a couple of these false teachers. He's going to kick them out of the church. He's going to say, you got to go. You're corrupting God's people. You're distracting everyone. Your own hearts are consumed with sin. You've got to get out of here. You've got to be removed from this community. So he goes to do that. Does not go well. In fact, one of them betrays Paul, gets him arrested again. That's what sends him back to prison in Rome, and that's what will ultimately lead to his, his death. But while Paul is in prison, he writes another letter to Timothy, which is absolutely crazy. I mean, think about this. Like, you go from Acts 20, Paul is warning these elders, hey, like, this is going to happen. These wolves are going to come. So imagine how frustrated he probably would have been when he gets out of prison, being imprisoned for the gospel, and he finds out that these guys compromise. How easy would it have been for Paul to throw his hands up and go, well, I tried, but they're a bunch of dummies, so I'm moving on. But he didn't. Instead, he took his apprentice, who he calls a son in the faith, somebody he cares deeply for, and he says, hey, you're ready, it's time, I need you to go, and I need you to preach the gospel there. We're not giving up on these people. And so he sends them, and then Timothy sends a report, and he's like, hey, Paul, not going good. Like, they're, they are, in fact, a bunch of dummies. Like, they're arguing with me. They're not listening. Like, this is not, this is not good. And again, like, it had been so easy for Paul to respond, go, okay, get out of there. Come home. We're done. But no, he goes. He goes and he tries to reason with them and he tries to help them see the truth. And what do they do? They turn on him. These people who who he with tears proclaimed the gospel and invested the gospel for three years. And then he sent for them because he just wanted to tell them goodbye because he's like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. And I wanted to see you one last time. They turn on him, send him back to prison. And in prison, knowing, okay, this time I'm not getting out. This time it's going to be for real. This time they're finally going to kill me. What does he do? He writes another letter and he says, Timothy, don't give up. Don't give up preaching the gospel. Now this letter he writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy, it's absolutely incredible. But he spends the first few chapters building Timothy up, as you, you, you would understand would be necessary trying to get Timothy's mind right, trying to reestablish Timothy's priority and his outlook. And then he reminds him that what's happening should not come as a shock. And that's what we're going to pick out. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 1, it says this, But mark this, Paul says, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, this came up a lot. If, if you've not been with us just before Easter, we did an eight-week study of Revelation. Um, absolutely incredible journey, but, but we talked a lot about last times, and we said in the context of the first century, when Christians talked about last times, the end of times, the end times, all of that, all of those buzzwords ultimately we're talking about is the time in which they were living. When they talk about, when they use that phrase, they're talking about the time from the cross till Jesus Christ finally comes back. 
And so the last times are very much the time in which they're living. And so what Paul is ultimately saying, he's saying, don't be surprised by this. We know that there will be terrible days in these last days. Why? Because Satan is swinging wildly. Because he knows that he has a shelf life. Evil knows it is coming to an end. And it's going to try to create as much chaos as it possibly can. In the meantime, evil is causing a ruckus. And that ruckus is playing it out itself out in the hearts of people. In the corruption of good soil. He goes on to say this. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud, abusive disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure (coughs) rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having nothing to have nothing to do with such people. They talk the talk But they do not walk the walk. They are all show. But it is a very convincing show. It goes on to say this. They are the kind who worm their way into homes, gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. They're manipulative. They're selfish. They're shallow. They prey on the weak. These are men who are consistently encountering God's word, but there is zero life change because their hearts are not good soil. Their hearts are corrupted. The word enters their hearts, but it never penetrates or changes their hearts. Paul goes on to give an example of of this from from a historical context. He says, just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. Based on Jewish tradition, these are the names of the magicians within the court of Pharaoh in Exodus. Though the book of Exodus doesn't call them by name, we, we, we certainly know the story. Moses and Aaron come to, to confront uh, uh, come to confront Pharaoh, and they're given the sign from God that Aaron will throw down his staff and it'll turn into a snake. When, when that happens, what we're told is that Pharaoh calls his magicians, and by their secret arts, Exodus tells us, they're able to copy the exact same trick. But what we know is that this trick is counterfeit. It's just that. It's a trick. And Paul is boldly stating that these false teachers, they look the part. They sound the part. And they are capable of some tricks. But they are, in fact, counterfeit. He goes on to call them this. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far. Because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. It's a firm reminder that that though it may be hard to wrap your head around, evil is not winning. Evil has a shelf life. Expiration is coming. But what's sobering is, is that evil can do a lot of damage in the meantime. You need to be careful who you are listening to. You need to be careful as to what your mind is exposed to. You need to be careful as to what's being given the authority to impact your heart. You must be on guard because savage wolves are coming. Paul goes on to say this, verses 10 to 15. Incredible. You, however, he's talking to Timothy, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, <coughs> sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There is so much here. 
And it is all really, really important, but, but I want to get to our point for today. Uh, so I'm just going to summarize the, the, the contrast between Paul and these false teachers. Is that Paul did not merely preach the words. Paul lived the words. A life lived out in the open. Paul wasn't hiding anything. He, he was fully present with those he taught, and he was fully available. This is so incredibly important, especially in our day and age. But it's a whole other sermon. And here's what we have been driving toward today, though. Two verses. And if you have glazed over everything else to this point, wake up right now. Because <laughs> these are hugely important. Verses 16 and 17, look what Paul says. In light of all this, in light of all these false teachers, these wolves that are coming, the battle for your heart, remember this, all scripture, all of God's word is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So there's some very, very important truths that we're going to draw out of this. I would encourage you to write them down. And the first one is this. God always speaks with purpose. Every single word of Scripture, God has spoken with purpose. If we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed, then we believe that every word of Scripture was, that has ultimately come out of the mouth of God did so on purpose. God does not waste his words. God never speaks without purpose. Everything God says, he said on purpose because everything God says comes from God's heart. Consider Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word desires to build you up, to make you whole. And this is very, very good news. God's word desires to complete you. God's word desires to put you back together. God's word desires to heal you. God's word desires to prepare you for a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. That's what God's word desires to do. But you may be asking, well, why does God's word say so much hard stuff then? So much uncomfortable stuff. Here's why. We seldom grow in comfort. We seldom grow in comfort, and we would love for that not to be true, but unfortunately it is. Rarely, if ever, do you grow from comfort. You grow in discomfort. More often than not, growth is associated with pain. My son, Parker, he's been learning this. 13, obsessed with football. He's gotten into working out. He's learned the old adage, pain is gain. Growth hurts. Growth is good for you. Scripture often hurts. In fact, I would be very, very wary, wary of sitting under un, any teaching that just makes you feel good. And that statement, it, it may not sit well initially, but consider this. Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Which of those gates do you think is comfortable? Wide gate. It's wide, it's luxurious, there's plenty of elbow room. It's comfortable. The narrow gate is hard. Consider this, Matthew 16, 24 to 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take up their cross. Follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever there loses their life for me will find it. It's uncomfortable. Obedience always is. But obedience leads to life. Obedience leads to this. Revelation 21, 3 through 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death 
or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. The reward is very comfortable, supremely comfortable. And the uncomfortable road of obedience is the only way to get there. But maybe you are thinking, yeah, but, but all of this discomfort that Scripture introduces, honestly, it just kind of bums me out, makes me feel bad about myself. I would ask you to consider this. Our wretchedness is what makes grace amazing. It's your wretchedness that makes grace so amazing. Grace is amazing because of the contrast. I was lost. But now I'm found. I was blind. But now I can see. Scripture, God's word, it provides that contrast. It's uncomfortable work is dividing the good from the bad in our hearts so that the bad can be drug out into the open so that Jesus Christ can deal with it. Because only he can. And when he does, when we allow him to, guess what's left behind? Good. Good soil where growth can happen rapidly. And that leads to to this final reality. You were created for more. You were created for more. You were created for, for more than mere existence. You were certainly created for more than death. You were created for life. If all scripture is fulfilled in Christ, then we need to look no further than the words and example of Christ to best understand the desire of God's word. Jesus said it, John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what evil wants to do. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Now think back on what Paul was dealing with in Ephesus. How were these false teachers leading people astray? By presenting false options of what the good life is. They were creating division and dissension. By making false promises as to where life can be found. By clouding their minds with confusion. When we look to Christ, what does he offer? He offers real life. And where is it found? In him and him alone. And how do we get to Christ? By following the path, the narrow gate that can only be illuminated by the lamp of God's word. What does God's word want to do? He wants to lead you to life in Christ. And that must be our aim every single time we speak it. Every single time we study it, every single time we read it, every single time we allow it to be invested into our own hearts to lead our hearts and minds deeper into the presence of Christ. So what do you do with that? How do you take all this truth and and put that into action? You get into the word. I want to give you a very, very simple challenge. Okay, here, here's where, I, where, where you can begin. If you're already in the Word on a daily basis, awesome. Reinvigorate it. Here's the simple, simple challenge. Give me 30 minutes a day. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night. Now, if you're already reading God's Word more than that, don't, don't deduce. Like, keep going. But if you're new to this, if being in God's Word is not a regular practice for you, here's what I want to challenge you to do. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night. And because any good challenge has a length of time, here's what I want you to consider doing. Go 22 days. And if you don't know where to start, start in Psalm 119. Conveniently, it's chopped into 22 parts. And so make that your goal. Every morning, read one of those chunks of Psalm 119. Every night, read it again. Every morning, start your day with God's word. Every night, end your day with God's word. Allow it to bookend your life because that's where life is found. So let me pray for you. As you set out to to accomplish this goal, challenge has been accepted. Dive into God's word, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, 22 days, and I guarantee you, your heart will be different. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you so much for that truth. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And Father God, we we acknowledge today, we profess today that he is the hope of the world. And Lord, that hope is found 
on the pages of your word. And God, we are so, so grateful for it. God, I thank you so deeply that not only did you inspire that word, Father God, but you have invested that word into the hearts and minds of so many that have gone before us. And Lord, out of their obedience, they allowed it to explode from their lips that it might encounter our hearts. And Lord, I, I thank you and I am so grateful that we live in a day and age in which we have access to all of it. That we can have it on pages, we can have it on screens, we, we can realistically approach your word literally any time we want. We have life at our fingertips 24 hours a day. And so Father God, give us the, the, the courage, give us the boldness to refuse to believe the lies that paint a picture, a false picture of what life is. And, and Lord, may we instead cling to the true life, the real life that can only be found in Jesus Christ. May we devote ourselves to this. May we practice this. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.